Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I've talked a lot in the past and recently about the stability of systems. So specifically the stability of our climate system. We're very rapidly approaching a point of time when there's no Arctic sea ice. And of course that will leave Greenland exposed up in the Arctic. You know, temperatures are going to greatly increase in the whole region. And the uh, without an Arctic sea ice cover, there'll be a much more influence from the heat from the Atlantic and the Pacific coming into the Arctic. The Arctic, Arctic is going to be a much warmer place. And without sea ice, it will... The climate up there will be one of a marine climate as opposed to the existing almost continental-like climate. When there's a sea ice covering over the Arctic Ocean, then there's no exposed water or very little exposed water. It's mostly solid ice with snow on top of it. So you have a continental climate. You can get a cold air mass sitting on top of that ice because of the Coriolis force deflecting things to the right in the northern hemisphere, the air leaving that high pressure area curves to the right and you get a clockwise rotation, the Beaufort gyre and the transpolar drift. And of course, without sea ice and a warm ocean there, especially in the winters, because it takes time to cool down due to the huge heat capacity of the oceans, you'll have a low pressure area over the Arctic. So the air moving in will deflect to the right and you'll get a counterclockwise rotation. So the, the whole circulation pattern in the atmosphere and the ocean shifts with no sea ice. And you have a lot more water vapor, a lot more precipitation, and of course very rapid rises of temperature over Greenland which will greatly increase the loss, <clears throat> the, the melt from the uh, ice sheets on Greenland. You know, how high will those temperatures go? Well, in the past, in the paleo records, between 60,000 years ago and about 22,000 years ago, there were these huge excursions of temperature rise, rises up to 16 and a half degrees Celsius um, in the matter of a decade or two occurring in Greenland you know, these, these uh, Dansgaard Osher oscillations. So I'm going to talk about a recent paper that looks at the influence of sea ice on these oscillations because this is a world that we're rapidly approaching. So you have basically stability and then as you start getting perturbations, you can get corrections within a certain zone and then boom, you, go, you jump to another uh, state. Okay, so let's have a look at the paper and let's have a look at what's going on here. Okay, so this is, um, this is my website, paulbeckwith.net. This is my last, the last post, and I was talking about amplified warming at high elevations. So this is another feedback for Greenland and Antarctica because the ice is very thick, sitting on bedrock, it's very high up. And what we actually see is we get um, elevation dependent warming, as I showed in a, the last couple of videos. So this means that as you go higher and higher in Greenland and Antarctica, it's likely that the rate of warming uh, will is, is increased. So when you combine that with the latitudinal effect, which causes the Arctic region to warm, you know, three to five times warmer than the global average, and then add another factor of two or three for the elevation warming, and you get the picture. You get very, very fast warming on Greenland and Antarctic glaciers. This is my uh, Twitter um, handle, Paul H. Beckwith, my Twitter page. And I tweeted out this um, Arctic sea ice loss from abrupt climate change. Okay, so this is a new study on ice cores showing reductions of, how reductions of sea ice in the Arctic between 
it's actually about 22 and 60,000 years ago, led to very, very significant changes. Um, Facebook, just to remind you, you know, from, you know, Spock here to destroy your home planet's ecosystem for imaginary wealth is highly illogical. Listen to this guy, this wise guy. Okay, so going to this uh, paper, the Arctic sea ice loss in the past linked to abrupt climate events. This is a news release on it. And basically, it was talking about Greenland temperatures rising as much as 16 degrees Celsius. It's actually 16 and a half degrees. So this paper was just published um, a few days ago. And it looks at oxygen isotopes and nitrogen isotopes to determine these act as a paleothermometer, if you like, to give the temperature. And as you go back in as you look at an ice core that's drilled deeply into the ice, you can go back, you know, look at the different layers. And you can look at the air bubbles and you can also look at the isotopes that are actually making up the water. And, you know, ox normal oxygen is oxygen 16, but there's a heavy version, oxygen 18, a stable isotope. And the concentration of the, 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 the ratio of these different isotopes, because of fractionation, you, f you can actually get a, determine a temperature, associated with a temperature, also with nitrogen isotopes. So these, there were many significant abrupt changes in, in uh, the northern regions, and they're picked up in the Greenland ice cores. These are called Dansgaard Osher events, some of the fastest and largest abrupt climate changes ever recorded. Okay, so there was a puzzle about the correlation between Arctic sea ice loss and these extreme abrupt climate events found in the ice core record on Greenland. Okay, so what they're doing is they did modeling and they looked at the ice cores and what they see is that there's a huge impact. And it's kind of obvious there's a huge impact of Arctic sea ice concentration or level, the amount around Greenland, and the melt rate and temperatures over Greenland. And this has huge implications because we're actually losing Arctic sea ice. So the link to the paper is here. You can just click on that. And what you can see is, okay, well, this is, if you Google Arctic sea ice graphs, you can see what the sea ice is doing, basically get real-time information on what the sea ice is doing. And it's setting, it's, it's near record lows. It's not forming as much as it should in the winter. It's melting out quickly in the summer. I still think it's likely to be gone um, by the, you know, the sea ice minimum. It's going to go to zero, uh, you know, could happen, you know, in the next uh, three or four years. Um, the trend is very sharply down. The actual year it happens is, you know, an open question still. So this is the paper. If you click on that uh, link in the article at the bottom here, this is the uh, paper, Impact of Abrupt Sea Ice Loss on Greenland Water I Isotopes During the Last Glacial Period. Um, you can open the PDF, it's open source, and here we go. Um, now I'm gonna talk about this paper in great detail, and there's also a, a supplemental part of the paper um, which is, is a link from the actual paper on supplementary figures. But first of all, I want to talk about some important background things. So it's a, by Brits, and instead of saying glacial, they say stadial, and instead of saying interglacial, they say interstadial. Okay, this, uh, the, the stadial is, th these are, this is just different terminology. Um, this is an image of Greenland, and this shows you where the different, uh, so Camp Century, an American um, uh, Cold War base, basically. These are Northern Greenland Ice um, Project, Greenland Ice Sheet Project, um, Die 3. These are different sites where coring has been done on Greenland, and many of these are referred to in the paper, so you can see where they are basically. Um, I like Google Earth and you can go and you can, you know, do a search for things. There's not a lot that you can see in, in the ice. I mean, you can see um, some of the um, 
surface meltwater um, ponds and things. You know, um, in various parts, you can see some structure and so on. But, you know, I tried to see if there was any details of some of these areas. You know, if you could see huts and things where the ice core drilling was done. And I wasn't able to see it with this. Um, if you just Google Dansgaard Osher oscillations, you can actually get um, some information on, on them. Um, these periods where there was very abrupt, rapid warming, and then there was cooling over periods of time as you go back, and then there's rapid warming and cooling and so on. Um, and, you know, the periods was about, about 1,500 years or so, but the warming would happen, you know, in a decade or two. Now... We use the oxygen and nitrogen isotopes to get an idea of temperature. So here's what happens. If you've got the ocean here, you've got H2O. This is the, the, the light, the normal, heavy, you know, the most abundant oxygen, making up the H2O, oxygen 16. You've also got heavy oxygen. Um, it's a stable isotope, H2O. Now, when you get evaporation, of course, the lighter molecule is going to be favored. So up here, there's going to be mostly, the water vapor is going to be mostly H2 with 16O. There'll be a deficit of H and 18O. Then when you get precipitation, the vapor condenses into clouds and you get precipitation, it's mostly the heavier H2, 18O that will be rained out. So there'll be more and more of a deficit of the heavy oxygen so this will almost be, be light oxygen, okay? So as the cloud moves further and further inland, there's less and less of the heavy oxygen. So the ice is formed by the precipitation, the snow falling, and it's mostly the light, the 16O, okay? Snow and ice are depleted in the H2-18O relative to seawater, okay? So that's a key point. Um, now, when we have a non-glacial period, so it's warmer, or this is an interglacial or uh, interstadial point, the ocean is containing both 16 oxygen and 18 oxygen. In the water molecules, there's evaporation. The heavy stuff is rained out, so this, what's left up here is isotopically light, H2O. The further inland it goes, it becomes more isotopically light because the heavy stuff is rained out and then the runoff goes back into the ocean okay now what happens in glacial periods is that the more and more of the light stuff gets deposited on land so that what's left is heavier so seawater is enriched in the heavy h2o and the ice is enriched in the light h2o okay so that's the key point so depending on the temperature, um, you know, if the temperature is warm, you get more of the you get more of both the heavy and light evaporated. If the temperature is cold, you get more of the much more of the light, much less of the heavy evaporated. The heavy wants to stay in the water, so the amount of H two O, the isotopic uh, analysis of it, both in the seawater and on the land, gives you an idea of the temperatures, okay? So this is a key point. Okay, so now these Greenland ice cores, okay, so this paper is open source. You can just Google this, Impact of Abrupt Sea Ice Loss on Greenland Water Isotopes During the Last Glacial Period. Of course, the, ice, the water isotopes gives you an idea of the temperature, so it's like the paleothermometer. Now, there's also going to be seasonal effects, and there's also going to be um, effects because of the, the, the amount of water vapor in the air is going to change significantly depending on whether or not there's uh, sea ice. So we're going to tease all that stuff out of this paper. And like I say, um, this is key because we're heading to a world where we're going to lose the sea ice in the summer, and that will have enormous impl implications for temperatures in the Arctic, jet streams globally, um, and rate of Greenland melt.